Hi, everybody. Good morning and welcome to Exploring Our Irresistible Passion. I really do love that title. So, we're going to go into power and it's your power. Um, I have to start with a prayer. My new book, my new book that I've been working on for years, actually, for years, it's called The Holy Language. Prayer, Guidance, and Grace. And I might read some of it I, because I, I, I bring it along because I have to work on it a little bit every day. And I, I've left some of it in my room, but I, I, I'm, I'm thinking I might test some of the prayers on you. I haven't decided that, so I left it downstairs so I wouldn't be tempted, but I am going to probably do that because I... Why, hello. Hello. Louder? Okay. <laughs> so it's my fault. <laughs> so, at any rate, part of why I'm even writing this book has a great deal to do with why I want to do this workshop and this type of workshop. And this book was a long time in coming, and, and I actually have. Oh, still louder? Still louder? Wow. You think something about the space? Wait a minute. What if I moved myself? No, we're good now. That's good. Okay. That, that's about as good as we can get right now. Okay. It starts getting goofy. It's better. It's better. It's better. I like better. Okay. Better is good. <laughs> better is good. Okay. Let me get. Is this better? Yes. Is this better? Yes. See? Okay. So I'll come up here. All right, so let me explain. Yep, part of, I actually have someone in the audience, Sue Helms, sitting there eating me. I was, but Sue's been part of my life for years and years and years, and she's actually my gardener, and she's a magic gardener, and she became a magic friend. So Sue knows, she'll come through the garden, and she'll say, how are you doing? And I, I'm working on that book, <laughs> so she. But this particular book is something I didn't want to write. And because I did not want to write a book on prayer ever or go into this particular subject. Um, but nothing else would work for me. And I've probably written 3,000 pages of other books that went nowhere. And I'm not kidding. And I want to share this, not because I like to, you know, kind of show you the inside of a frustrating office. But because I'm going to talk to you about your journey of power, which is what it is. And I think there, there's so much about the mystical journey that um, is, for me, so phenomenal in that it is in our blood and in our bones. It's in the day of our life. It's in the grit of our life, it's in, the <clears throat> it's in the anguish of our life, and it's in the triumph, and it's in the final letting go and finally saying, I'm going to do this, I don't want to do this, but I'm going to do this. And even in the agreement, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy, and why, why would this be so difficult for me? And, and maybe we'll talk about it, maybe not, but it's the, the point is that you're oftentimes directed to do what you just don't want to do. And even in discovering why you don't want to do it, there is a treasure and an anguish. And this is the nature of what I have come to understand as the divine. Now, when we talk about power, and it's the only, to me, I want to repeat, that power is the fundamental ingredient of life. And one of the jewels in your pocket now is that I want you to see your life and everything in your life, every experience in your life, everything, everything about your life as a power negotiation. 
every word you use, every attitude you have, is this going to disempower me? Am I doing something to disempower another? Is this disempowering my health? Is this disempowering the whole? Am I afraid to empower this person? Even a compassionate thought disempowers. Do I need to have a, 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 a horrible thought about this group of people to disempower them from a better life here? Everything you do is a power negotiation. Everything you wear, I, I want Beth and Janet in the back are two of my closest friends, are like my sisters, and we have adventures. And one of the adventures that Beth and I often do in London is go to this um, um, Fortnum and, and Mason, and they have a place, one of the where they sell vintage Lottie Da clothes. <laughs> And they sell uh, fascinators. Now, Beth, Beth and Janet can wear fascinators because God gave them real hair, but me, right? And I'm recovering from the world's worst haircut. I don't know, but I, there it is. But anyway, I, uh, we go, and, and Beth can wear these fascinators. And I, I was with a friend, and I put one on with a, a, what do you call that, a pheasant feather? And she said, oh, yes, that's you. And I just looked at her, right? But there was a dress there that was one of those dresses that you could dream about wearing, right? And, and I, I, have, I, can, I, can, I can put my body into something like that, and I, I put it on. Do you remember that, Beth? And it had all these jewels, huh? A pumpkin color. Yes, and it had all those jewels and, and all of these kind of gorgeous, and I stood there and I thought, <laughs> I love this dress, and if I walked out on the street with it, if I went anywhere in it, everybody would say, it's not Halloween. It's a set, but it was, but I, you know, I don't have the archetype. I don't have, and here's the operative word, I don't have the power. There's nothing in me that could empower me in that gorgeous, gorgeous, stunning, thousands of pound gown. That on me would disempower me. Even though it was a luscious piece of high fashion. But if you don't know your power, now Janet in that would not get out of the court. But I can't do that. I don't have that kind of goddess archetype. Okay, so I can't, even though this gown was like thousands of dollars, probably worn by who knows who, and I don't need, <laughs> but I can't do it. It doesn't, I don't have the archetype that goes whoosh, and animates it. Now it's really important to know this. It's important to know what power really is. So that when you think about, I have to take my power back, what are you talking about? From what? Who are you talking about? You wanna walk up to someone and say, give me my power back. What are you talking about? You have to know your own power, period. You have to know you, where you belong and where you don't. What your lane is and how to manage your lane so it becomes a highway. Nobody has your power. If you don't have it, no one else does. You've never animated it. You abdicate it. It's up to you to begin to understand what your power is. And it's never, it's never, never, never mattered until now. Because we've never lived in the era of invisible power until now in the way that we do. Now is what this era is all about. Is the era of our invisible anatomical system our invisible nature, our quantum nature. So now it matters. 
So now you actually feel your self-hemorrhaging power. You actually feel it. Before, before the quantum age, before the nuclear age, before we were nuclear creatures, we didn't measure ourselves like this. We didn't think like this. We didn't have the vocabulary, the tools. We didn't live in that world. Power was physical. We measured it in stuff and in substance and in, and in, and in um, the class of people we were and in aristocracy and in our capacity to push people around and stomp on them. And now we're moving through. And, and shortly before that, even as, as recent as the late 19, 1800s, people still it, amazingly in Russia where they still had serfs serfs Lenin was the child of a serf they would actually have card games and bet serfs bet human beings it's incomprehensible but that we are such primates we are just a century away from being that type of creature where that was acceptable to bet human beings. I'll bet you a thousand serfs on this poker game. And it meant nothing. It meant nothing. That there was an acceptable part, depending on where you lived. So let us not kid ourselves that we are that advanced. Can we agree on that? Let's not think that we've just, boy, have we made inroads. No, we haven't. No, we haven't. No, we haven't. No, we haven't. And in fact, what we're facing in our country is look how easily it is, easy it is for us to go backwards. Right. We're still making pipe bombs and whatever. I mean, it's, just, it's astonishing. Oh, I say our country. I, I forget that I'm in Canada. <laughs> I'm going to, south of here. <laughs> Okay, so, the, from, if, oh, someone took my artwork away. <laughs> <laughs> Silly. <laughs> Silly. <laughs> someone removed my artwork. Well, we'll fix that. Okay. <laughs> wow. Wow. Goodness me. Okay, in these in these pieces of th these illustrations that most of you have seen before, those have not. You're in for a treat. <laughs> but they're simple, but they work, and they illustrate points I want to make about you in power. And honestly, I learned so much from being a medical intuitive about. Uh, what I didn't realize about us, which is we are really power creatures. We're invisible power creatures. Uh, when I started out, um, and I, if, if, if there's a reason why God maneuvers you to do things. You're, let me explain something here. Your ego chooses a life that you fantasize about. So it gets all the fantasies out. And your ego, the, the life your ego chooses is often the life that's filled with all your negativity, all your negative ambitions, as well as your fantasy ambitions, as well as, it's kind of like a garbage bag. <laughs> it includes a lot of that stuff. The life your soul, the agenda your soul has, on the other hand, is the path that has, that knows what your actual power is. And it's the kind of power your ego, if it knew, is turned off by because it's very rarely glamorous. It's very rarely the kind of thing that shimmers and shines at the offset. It's very rarely full of Tiffany diamonds in the beginning. 
because the life that your soul knows you have and the power you have there is all about what you can do for others and the ego it's usually what you want for yourself and there's a defining difference the ego in you is motivated by there's not enough what about me the soul in you is what about them what about them somebody's got to do something for them when I wrote invisible acts of power I'll never forget this story this woman told me she was homeless she was homeless and she looks across at a woman who was homeless and thought oh my god that poor woman's homeless but so was she and in that moment she forgot about herself and prayed for that woman who was homeless and said god help her god help her and a few minutes later a, a priest came over to this woman praying for that woman and said you look hungry and he said you know we have a shelter over here and he brought her in and that woman and got to talking to her next thing you know he said you know I could do, what what skills do you have she said well I, I, I could do a little typing whatever hi next thing you know she was the parish secretary and it just so happened he had a room there not much but he, she could stay there next thing you know she ran the parish Okay. And the whole thing she prayed for. She forgot about herself and the power of the soul. Like this is that whole concept that it's very hard for your the ego to grapple with that. The longest journey of our lives is between our ego and our soul. That's the longest journey you will ever ever make is between the life of your ego and the life of your soul and oh just and I, I need to make this disclaimer when I speak about the soul I am NOT speaking about anything religious at all the soul has no religion and it never did any more than there is a God that has a religion or any allegiance to a religion whatever the divine is it does not belong to a religion nor does it have a religion so let us be very clear about that the only thing that is common to the divine is law the laws that run your body The laws that run this universe the laws that run nature and in that you're going to find the nature of the divine what are laws consistent you can count on them and if you break them you can count on karma you can count on what Jesus said what goes around comes around as above so below this place is organized make no mistake angels have realms spirits have kingdoms planets have orbits and you have purpose none of you is an apple rolling from a tree your life has laws built into it a contract just because you your ego panics and says but there's not enough that's when your soul should take your ego and put it in a toilet for seven minutes because <laughs> you're bitching I want more not enough not enough not enough not enough so this is I get to have a nice tea okay okay so I need to just position us again because I want you to have a couple of images that I'm going to be referring to and this of course is that wonderful building and your first floor is base level consciousness where you take everything literally where you believe what you see this is the place you pay your mortgage this is the place where we all share time 
And as we go up on the floor, time gets what? Relative. On the fourth floor, time is not the same for any of us. Because time is a made up thing. And it's really hard for me to communicate how that happens. But I learned that through medical intuition. I learned that through the speed at which people heal. Why is that relative? Why is healing relative? What, why, why, and I'll get to that in a minute, so don't distract me. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's your fault. Okay. Now, and, and this is where, as we, is, we are speaking this, this time together, when we come up to a high voltage principle, something that, you know, um, a major league truth, like, God is law versus a persona that's living somewhere out there, a daddy figure. Now that's a great big huge transition in consciousness that a lot of people can't make. Here, here's God is human, here's God is law. Now there's a lot of people that will say, I can't, I'm sorry, but this is, I'm, I'm sticking right here. I need a human concept, I need a daddy figure. And I need all that's involved with that power relationship. I need to think that when I'm disempowered, I can pray like a child, this is archetypal, and have a daddy swoop in. I need a parent-child relationship, which makes me feel that whatever I do wrong, daddy will make right. Now this archetypal relationship is very, very destructive, extremely destructive at, in your archetypal roots. It's also the source of many depressions, so much depression. It's also the reason people won't heal in many cases because they just grit their teeth and think, I'm so miserable about this life, and if, if I'm miserable enough, Daddy will come fix it and give me the life I want. So it's a really tough myth to let go of. It's this idea that it's a personal universe. Personal. <coughs> personal. But if I put you in the Hubble telescope and said, get out there, and you started passing this galaxy and you got to the Sombrero galaxy or you got to, the, to, to, to any of the other out there, it would be very hard for you to maintain this off-planet image of the construct of an Abrahamic religion from planet Earth. Do you see what I'm saying? Whereas the idea that there's a divine being that has constructed all this in an orderly way, that, that can take the journey with you. So, at some point, we make the transition to impersonal power. From personal to impersonal, and that is huge. That is your major transition. That's gonna be a major transition point where how a person manages your power is not about what you say to someone else. I'm gonna get my power back. You have my power. You'll never get your power back that way. You just are always <laughs> gonna be angry and screaming and disempowered because that works for you. You're a screaming person. <laughs> You're a screaming angry person and your way of getting your power back is you'll show them you will scream and you will have tantrums and you'll be difficult and you'll have to complain and this is your level of power. Loud, public. Loud and public. So that shift to realizing, I just want to punish others. I just want to make them know I'm suffering. I have an agenda here.
just shifting to none of this was personal ever. None of it. I am assuming all these people here are here to serve my life when no one is, and I have got to grapple with that. And that is a hard truth to swallow. So this is the difference. Down here things are true, up here things are truth. Big, huge, great big, huge difference. What is true and what is truth? What is true and what is truth? Big, huge journey. What is true will never heal you. It will make you sick. Truth heals. True makes you sick. Because what is true is relative. What is true for you is true for you. But there's no truth in it. What is true for me is true for me. It is true that in the room I'm standing in, I see all your faces. It is also true that you do not, and we're in the same room. Everything is relative. So, this journey of power, prior to the nuclear age, this type of microcosmic thinking wouldn't have made any difference. We wouldn't have even been able to comprehend it. Any more than if you said to someone in the 1920s, there's going to be a box on your desk. Someday you can hit a button, button, button that says send and reach everybody in the universe in one second. And it's going to go through the air. It's going to hit this flying thing in the space. And then it's going to just communicate to everybody in the whole wide world. There's no way you could communicate that. There's no way you could prove it. There isn't even a way you could make it seem scientific because the language wasn't invented. The concepts weren't invented. Our way of thinking wasn't invented. There was nothing about it. The groundwork, the foundation, nothing. Our wiring wasn't in place to even comprehend such a thing. We were all dense creatures here, too dense. The moment hadn't come for us, for our quantum wiring to open up. But when we entered the nuclear age in that one second, in that one microsecond when it went boom, our wiring opened instantly. The whole of humanity, we went and we became energetic creatures. Just like that, the, the, the glass that, what do we call that thing? Hourglass shifted and we went to the other side. And now we have to understand the nature of our power anatomy, the anatomy of our power. Because this is really the sort, when I look at people who are experiencing you know madness they're experiencing all kinds of dysfunctions their loss of power their loss of energy their loss of stamina um, autism um, all the many disorders that are happening now that did not happen pre-nuclear age these are energy disorders is it getting warm in here yes is there a way we can cool this off because we're kind of heating up <laughs> just get some air maybe a little air would be yeah right the plastic is also big too mm -hmm. it's what it's off gassing a bit yeah. it's okay yeah we'll just well we'll just get some air yeah we'll just get air i'll do that we'll take that off yeah david will open it we'll get some air and they're just air windows and it's perfect yeah, okay, so, now, we are, are, we have to get to know ourselves 
as energetic creatures, our energetic biology, our energetic conversations, and we have to even understand how we relate energetically to each other and redefine the boundaries of relationships. We are redefining our sexuality. We've taken down the biological boundaries of our and are now describing ourselves by energetic boundaries of our sexuality. We are redefining energetic boundaries of relationships. So instead of the parameter, oh, wait, wait, wait. You thought I ran out of drawings, but alas, I have not. <laughs> okay, okay. These are your chakras. Okay. Okay, this is the literal world. First, second, and third chakra. Fourth through seventh is your energetic. And eight, nine, ten, which is your impersonal grace cosmic consciousness. Okay? So, your first, second, and third chakras. These, these, um, these are very Aries minded. Going back to the thinking of law. Your first, second, and third chakras, even the fact that you understand that word, speaks of this new time. That's perfect, David. That's, yeah, speaks of this era because your parents wouldn't have understood it for the most part. If I said to my dad, my chakras need, you know, <laughs> blank, right? Okay, so, but symbolically, the power zone of the age of Aries, which was pre-Jesus, was to me is a time that I'm absolutely spellbound by. I'm spellbound. I'm completely saturated in. And this was a time of law. This was a time when the laws came in. And I, I, I'm going to take us back just for a little story because I'm going to set up something that is a mechanism in us that, I, that you, have to, you have to see how you work. Things about you that I don't think you even realize that to me is so unbelievable. Um, first, one of the traits about a human being, and I want you, here's a, here's a jewel in your pocket now forever and ever, that you are going to pay attention to, is you are storytellers. All of you like to tell your stories about yourself. Big ones, little ones, true ones, not true ones. You exaggerate, you this or that. But you like to tell your stories. And what are your stories actually about? I want you to think about it. What are your stories actually about? Perceptions. Huh? Perceptions. Okay, what else? Power. 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 You're all telling power tales. No matter what the story is, you are telling a story about what's happened to your power. Every one of your stories, whether it's the woman that took your power, or the event that has your power, the sorrow that has your power, the situation that has your power, the power play you're in, every one of your stories is about your power. I want you to remember that. From this point on, there isn't a story you tell, not one, that isn't about your power. Where is it? Who is it? How was it affected? By meeting this person, I was empowered. By meeting this person, I was disempowered. I don't care if you don't use that word, but from now on you will. 
even if you keep it in the back of your head. This is going to be your magnet now. This is going to be your magnet. It's going to be your little bitty magnet, your soul magnet. Is this situation empowering me or is it not? Am I now hemorrhaging? I'm now hemorrhaging. Why am I hemorrhaging? Why am I losing power in this situation? What am I doing? So from now on, it's your power meter. This is costing me power and I, I've got to figure out why. So this is going to be for the rest of your life. You pull out like a, and you in your mind, I want you to imagine some kind of symbol that you pull out that is your meter. It says I'm, I'm losing it. So that here, here's my last drawing. And it's my icon, but now you're going to understand it. Here's your energy coming in through the top of your head. And when you are losing power, you actually hemorrhage. You actually really do hemorrhage. That's not an illusion. That's not a silly drawing. But in an ideal world, you should be in your orbit, just like a planet. You are a planet in an orbit. You are a planet in an orbit. And an orbit shouldn't lose its momentum. Everything in this universe is duplicated. We are planets in our orbits. You don't puncture your orbit. Okay? You don't allow a, a meteor to puncture, or, and you don't puncture another person's orbit. You behave yourself. You learn to manage your own power as well. You don't plot to hurt somebody because you're angry. Because here's what's true. Like it or not, we're not alone. Your thoughts are known. Your thoughts are heard. I don't care if I, this is not Catholic speak, it's just a fact. Now, and this I learned as a medical intuitive from the word, from the, my, my work in illness. Illness has no religion. Your biology has no religion, zero. So when you make choices, you hemorrhage. You get attachments, we'll go into this, I'm just gonna give you the, the fact of it and you develop what's called what I call anchors you anchor yourself you just anchor you know you anchor yourself now these anchors convert to psychic weight okay and that equals W A I T time that's how you create time your psychic anchors equal your relationship to time the more anchors you have the more you you will think this way I can't do this I I have all these attachments wait and it, it attaches in subtle ways to the world you're not willing to shuffle in order to resolve a problem, in order to let go of something, in order to move on. You're really not willing to let something go. Because the moment you pull up an anchor, something in your physical world will transition instantly. You pull up an anchor by recognizing while something may be true, the truth is, and up goes the anchor. And the situation that was created evaporates just like that. And you have to reestablish your footing in what's essentially a brand new universe. Maybe it's a universe without this, the job situation. Maybe it's the universe without a conflict that's familiar. Oh my, this conflict's gone, and I, I had, I'm used to this conflict, and now it's all gone. And who am I without all the support around this conflict? 
who am I without the support around this loss? They think I've got, I'm have got. i getting on with my life. Maybe, maybe in fact, I need to get on with my life. <laughs> oh my. Okay. Okay, so, you know, this person thinks I've forgiven him. Well, maybe I have. Maybe I need to because whatever it is, your world changes dramatically when you go from something being a truth and your sense of time does. And this is where I saw when it comes to healing that people don't want to heal. They regulate the speed at which they heal in terms of I'm not willing to let that go that fast. They want to extend the suffering, extend their permission to punish others extend their capacity to use their weakness a little bit longer because what will they have? How will they be able to say, do that for me, will you? I need that. They don't want to give up that kind of support system and they don't want to have people say, well, come on, you can do that for yourself now. Come on, let's go. Let's start taking care of yourself. Come on, stand up. It's time to adultize. Put your big girl pants on. I know, Hannah. <laughs> I know you don't want to hear it. But that's, but this, this, it's this type of thing you don't realize how you people have chosen, how often we choose to keep ourselves weak rather than Right, take on our capacity and in order to do that we have to stay hostile angry bitter unforgiving the choice is what that actually means is we have to keep a very negative inner life going by choice by choice in order to stay that way which is where you realize I've chosen my own suffering. And, but this is, you cannot blame others at that point. You've chosen your own suffering. If you recognize, this is what it means to finally come to terms with truth in yourself. I've chosen this and I'm not blaming you. I've chosen to be weak and there it is. It's a, it's a, it's a rigorous thing, this business of truth. It's a rigorous thing. Okay. Yeah. How do we know when we drop an anchor? Do we feel it? Is it How do you know when you cut an anchor? When you when first when you create an anchor. Wait a minute. Job. I'm gonna I'm gonna let Beth come with. Love the boots. How do we know when we create an anchor or drop an anchor? And also, how do we know when? In other words, what do we feel in the body? Well, everybody knows when they've just engaged an anchor because you're usually gutted. Does it always have to be the stomach or could it be, I mean, you know, well, you, you have an example of when, the, when it's coming in and then if you hammer it, right? People create the illness. The first, the first level of anchor is always in the first, second, or third chakra. So you're going to feel it somewhere in the lower back. You'll feel it in the stomach because it's visceral. It's visceral. You'll feel a tightness there. You'll feel it in the cold. You'll feel it somewhere down here when you've anchored. It feels like a punch, which is why, I mean, when you are, when people are feeling threatened or they're feeling like I'm, I'm because this is where the fight or flight mechanism is. This is where you first get the signal in your intuitive system. Get out. Don't do this. This isn't safe. Um, where your system puts up a field of protection. This is the first place where if you are not listening to your own guidance system, which is going mayday, 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 then you start feeling it here. You start feeling it right here. And um, all of you know the sensation? Okay, 
So that's what it means to feel like a hemorrhage, you know. And then it will spread up. And it can spread then into the heart area. Heartburn, it can spread to this area. It can then spread to various other areas of weakness in your body. But it, and the anchor will go from there. And then it also depends, then it takes on its specialty. It becomes a boutique anchor. <laughs> you know, but, you know, really, because it depends on whether the anchor is financial, if it's personal, if it's child. I mean, you know, anchors are boutiques. If it's deception, it, you know, it depends. I mean, there's any number of anchors that we have. If it's lust, if it's, you know, got it? And so you have to, when you cut an anchor, it's in the, in the middle and then the right part. When, yeah, when you cut an anchor, um, I'll put it in small because small works for big. If you get it small, you'll get it for everything. Have you ever cleaned out your closet? Yes. How's that feel? Feels good. Why does it feel good? No, the microphone is for micro, yeah. Well, you're, you're getting rid of. No, no, there's no your, you're talking about I. I'm getting rid of junk. I'm getting rid of things that I don't need or want. And when you, and when you don't, when you look at something and you think, I don't need this, but once I did, What's the difference in the feeling? When you once thought, I really wanted this, and now I don't, what's the difference? Now detached from it. And, and so you know that detachment? Yes. And then, but what's it feel like when you're detached? There's no energy. Bingo, and you throw it out. So now when you throw out all this junk, how's that feel? Lighter. Lighter is the operative word. <laughs> lighter is the operative okay. word. And what does lighter feel like? What is it, what, how, where do you feel it? What does it feel like? It's, a, it's an absence of heaviness first. And that's good, feels, that's good, it works. Which is, uh, it also feels uh, freedom, liberating, um, more choices, right? Okay, you have described everything. You, if I had gold stars, you get a gold star. Because it actually is light. You are actually describing what it really is. When you cut an anchor, you really do now have more light. So if I can put this in terms of money, if you get $100 a day as a budget, and you're spending $80 financing dead anchors, and then you suddenly cut off 40 bucks worth of dead anchors, you now have $60 a day f to finance your health and well-being and your life and your life in present time. And you are going to feel like pew, highly energized, rebooted, realive. That's not a word. Realive. And, and you're, not, you're not even going to get why you feel that way. But you're going to feel animated all over again. And I'm telling you, your cell tissue is getting rebooted. Everything's getting energized. And to shift to a completely different segue, which uh, sort of applies now, but I'll make it work, is the way Jesus healed instantly and then modeled that for other heals, but healers, was he healed in present time. There was no time in the way Jesus healed. We call that miracle, a miracle is something that we call an event that doesn't have any evidence of time in it. There's no evidence there was any time it's the thing that's absent in a miracle. Plus the fact that the laws of nature seem to be subject to the event versus the event subject to the laws of nature. This is important to get. So that the light thought or light precedes what happens to matter. So when we shift 
to more light than matter, your consciousness has more authority over the matter than the light. Your light has the authority over matter. Are you following my math? This is law. So therefore Jesus would say, as he did, what I'm teaching you, you can do if you got it. There's nothing special here. I'm teaching you law. Law. He was a teacher of law. And it was the laws of the cosmic, the cosmos, which is why he said, stop with the temples, go within now. I'm teaching you laws, the laws of consciousness. If you got it, if you understood. All right, are you with me? And this is our moment now where it's time for us to put our big people pants on and learn the laws. Because those myths of big daddies and holy half gods have come to a close. They've served us as far as they can. We now are on a planet that requires we become whole. Your body is your micro earth. And you've been already downloaded by the belief, the truth, that none of your body organs, i.e. nations, are sovereign. You cannot treat one of your body organ nations with so much priority that the other organs in your body suffer or your whole earth is going down. Now the way you treat your earth is felt in the whole earth because what is in one is in the whole. Now you're going to learn that and live by it because that's the law. We are a bio, holy, spiritual, ecological system. And this is the nature of God in us and around us. We'll never balance this ecology with light bulbs and recycling. <laughs> we have to recycle ourselves. It is we that need recycling, not our trash cans. Unless we get it. And we have got to become capable of living on this planet as one whole system of life, getting that we are all one. Like it or not. Now we don't like it, and we have got to reach a point where we do. Do you understand? We don't like it. We didn't grow up liking it. We were raised not liking it. That's our ego. Now you're going to bitch slap your ego till you get it out. Because we need to like it. And if not, gird your loins, because that's where we're going. That's the command of heaven, like it or not. And if you don't, die, because we'll die off. We will be the species that die off, but we won't win, no matter how much we fight, no matter how much. We will never win, because this any more than you can put up a fight on behalf of your kidneys because you want kidney doctors to win. But the fact is, holistic medicine is here to stay. This is the way we're going. Now, that is a high truth. And there are a lot of people that will not make it up there. They simply can't stand it. It's too big a truth for their little minds, their little bodies, and their tiny hearts and they'll implode before they get up there. They just can't bear it. 
They just can't bear it. It's too much. They can't evolve that fast. They can't evolve. So they'll recycle. That's okay. Because from the universe's point of view, it doesn't matter. You get a, many more lifetimes. They don't, our lives are not valued in the same way that we value them. It's like, oh, well, all right. It's not a big deal from that point of view. Just keep going. But this is the task that we are faced with. And we are on the cusp of entering that holistic era. So when people think holism is about medicine or health, you're crazy. That was the carrot. It's about living a whole different consciousness that is the most rigorous mystery that human beings have ever known. And a lot of people are not going to be able to do it. It's, it's, it, there's nothing easy about managing the whole of you in front of the whole of you and realizing there's no part of me that likes you. And that means there's something in me. And this is not the way I want to play this game. <laughs> this is not the way I want to play this game. This is really not the way I want to play it, but here I am. And what do I do? And it means that no matter what problems we see, we've got to find a way up to a higher altitude to resolve them. And nothing is as difficult. So you either toss it in now and say, no. like Muktananda said, don't go on the spiritual path because once you do, you can't get off. Can't get you can't get off, and it's better better not to start. <laughs> it's better not to start because it's a and, and even and all the great Catholic, Christian mystics, Catholic, would say, don't go in your soul unescorted because it's that difficult. And when I when I when I was in my late forties and I realized, I don't pray, not really pray. Not the real thing. And I was standing in my kitchen, and I thought, but look how smart I am, <laughs> right? Oh my God. And I remember standing there thinking, oh my God, where did that thought come from? And this incredible, ooh, like I had crossed a Rubicon. Like something, something that I had crossed some kind of Rubicon that said, you don't pray. And I thought, I, oh my God, I'm being told I need to pray it because of what's ahead of me. I just understood it. I understood everything so deeply in that moment in a way I didn't want to understand it. I don't know how to explain this to you. But I, I didn't want to understand how deeply I understood that. And I thought, no, 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 no. And I'm in the kitchen going, no, 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 no. And then I thought, I'm just going to go away. And, and, but you can't, where are you going to go? And, and that was the beginning of my, my true, my mystical, my deep, that was the beginning. And when I, I, I thought, I'll just forget about this happened ever. But I couldn't. I couldn't forget that voice. I couldn't. I couldn't. And then I thought, I'm not going in it alone. I will not do it. I won't. I won't. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And then I was doing a conference in Dingle, Ireland, and there was this man talking. And it turned out he was uh, a doctor of psychology, a Jungian analyst, a theologian, Catholic, south side of Chicago. I said, that's him. <laughs> That's him. So I went up to him and I said, do you take any more clients? And he said, I'm not sure. And I said, hmm. so let me put it this way. I will camp out on your porch. And I said, I wasn't being funny. I said, I'm desperate. I'm desperate. I said, I will not. I will camp out. I'm not kidding. And that's when I knew something deep and something 
but I didn't even know what it was. It was bubbling. And I thought, what's happening? And then I showed up two hours a week now for 18 years. The soul's a deep journey. A deep journey. Okay. So you know, yeah. Well, first of all, um, you know, you started off talking about this book that you're writing about prayer. And I kind of, I think I stopped breathing back then, and so I wanted to, and it, it feels like this is what you're really speaking about. Like, how do we move from the personal to an impersonal prayer? And yet, yes. we need company in the journey. That's right. And, um, you know, and how to voice that without being infantile. That's right. And at the same time, um, I don't know what it is. Like, maybe it's a different way of being with each other, that we are the company. We are the gods that we were always looking for outside. Mm -mm. And what does our prayer now sound like? Exactly. I mean, I think that <coughs> you touch on such a huge thing. What all of you have in common that has, in fact, been part of what's propelled you on your own journey is that all of you in your own way have asked, what's my purpose? Or maybe you've said, for what reason have I been born? Or maybe you've said something like, I know I was born for something special. But in any event, you've uttered something like that. Am I wrong? Have any, okay. Now, it's really important to recognize that because that is not a question, it's actually a prayer. It's actually a profoundly deep prayer, but you don't realize you said that. But it comes in this incredible mixture of time in which we've kind of given birth to a hybrid ego that is more than our first, second, and third chakra survival ego, and quite less than the soul. It's a hybrid that we've called the inner self. And we get into this inner self, and it's like this transport system that allows us to go into the world behind our eye and begin to speak an interior language, begin to examine our psyche and our soul and begin to speak about personal needs in a way that was never allowed before. We took the word self that goes with ego, but it was always selfish. And then the inner self got it and it's called self development, self-empowerment, self-protection, personal boundaries. This is language of the inner self. What the heck's the inner self? And then the inner self has become this part of you that you turn to to speak up on behalf of, well, for example, your deeper needs that you didn't quite know you had. So it goes on this t the exploration of this part of yourself. And it comes back and reports in. So it oftentimes is the first unit, like the moon unit, to go into yourself and come back and report about wounds that were long forgotten in your tribal personality, comes back and reports about, begins to kind of locate like a moon unit, what is that deeper thing in me that I see floating there 
and it looks like this big glowing substance that looks so beautiful it's your soul but you don't quite want to go in there because you start decorating your inner your inner moon unit and it starts getting real comfortable in there and for the first time in your inner moon unit you develop a moon unit language you can speak from this place in a way that you never have before. You can start reporting in all kinds of things that you're discovering, wounds and injuries, sensitivities. You can start establishing rules for yourself that weren't allowed in your tribal ego when you were selfish, but now you're in your inner self. An inner self to command unit, these are my boundaries. Now you're a different person. That's very different. You can't talk to me that way. Out. Over and out. Okay. Inner self. Now the inner self has come up with all kinds of ideas about itself for its own longevity. Because it has no intention of evaporating the way it should. It's on a temporary lifeline. It was only meant to take you across. But we've decorated it to become a permanent home. It's a problem. It's not a permanent home. But we've made it a permanent home. So you have to start reverting to keep it a permanent home. But in the inner self, part of its journey is to get us to discover, wow, we're quite a creative enterprise in this world behind our eye. We're quite something back here. It, I have to manage me. I have to get me, I have to deal with my conflict between wanting to abdicate my responsibility and power to other people so they pay my bills or take care of me or responsibility and take care of myself. I have to figure out how to manage me and survive. I have to figure out how to be me. I have to figure out what this power is, how to love, how to use this power that's me, how to individualize. Now, I have to figure out what do I believe? Who created me? What reason? Now the inner self likes itself so much. It's manufactured its own theology. I think I was born for something special. <laughs> By God, I think I was. <laughs> I was born to do something very special. I'll drive myself around this world until I see something special out my window. I was born and I'll give birth to little beings in little moon units and tell them they were born for something special just like me and i'll tell everybody i know these are moon unit babies born for something special see boop, boop, boop. they're all over even by the time they're three months old i can tell that's a special moon unit <laughs> christ okay <laughs> meanwhile this idea of being special has enriched our way of thinking so much that we're so impressed with ourselves that we can't bear to have anybody challenge our specialness at all. No, 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 no. You will be shunned from my moon unit. Shunned forever. Simultaneously, as part of what's happening is our interior senses are opening up, our intuition, our psychic sensitivities are opening. And we can't manage that because it makes our moon unit go like this and this and this and this and this, like I'm being bombarded by all this energy. And I have to learn to read this energy in my moon unit. And this requires prayer. This requires this, but the problem is my moon unit's not programmed with any high voltage concept of God. I, I've decided in my genius that I know how this universe was created. 
And I've decided that I, don't, I know exactly what I don't have faith in with great conviction. And I don't know what the hell I do have faith in. So I'm a floating moon unit, faithless, looking, of course, for my great reason to be born and a God I don't even have belief in, so there you go. I'm a lost moon unit without a cause. <laughs> On a holy mission going nowhere. <laughs> And that's the truth about most people's lives these days. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. All because you're so damn afraid to make a commitment to anything, lest you are humiliated or bored. And that's the shame of the narcissistic ego these days. Tis true. Tis true. So. And then there's prayer. Because that God, that God, somehow doesn't feel right. Doesn't resonate anymore. So we're gonna hit a pause button and go over here and say, well, the time has come for all religions to dismantle. Because though, and it's not the criticism of those religions, believe me. I love Catholicism. I adore it. I love Judaism. I love these traditions. And, I, and, and I, I love the mysticism from them. And it is the mystical traditions that I am putting in my jewel box. But the packages they've come in, the religion is the politics of God. Let's be clear. And the mysticism, the jewels, belong to the cosmos of God. And these will remain. These will remain, the great mystical teachings. But the politics, the political structures, have got to crumble as the political structures are with many of the political systems that divide us. That's all one. Come up here, very high. If you can see clearly, you'll see archetypally that there's no difference in the crumbling of the political, there's just the political system, period. If it's a political system, it's going to crumble. Because political systems have one thing in common, the mythologies are erroneous. They're going to crumble. They're based on a patriarch, and it's not about bad men, no. It's about the way the system functioned for so, and now that system is evaporating wherever you find it. So that a whole, a difference, and it's going to be chaos. Nothing will be smooth about this. It's never smooth because we never ever want to cooperate. So there's a real good chance that in the centuries to come, churches will be museums. And the Vatican, I don't know. It's, it's a heartbreak at the physical. But you feel it here because those stories do not fit your template anymore and you don't even realize why your template's gone. If you come here to the physical level, you can say to me, well, those priests and well, this. You're just going to give me a bunch of nonsense. You're just going to speak like some street dredge. Which has nothing to do with the archetypal transition of the deanimation of these mythologies of what's really happening. That the lights have gone out and there's a collision of those gods and it's the end of the half god, half man archetype of God. And how that dribbles down, dribbles down. And now as we discover the next level of power in ourselves, as Jesus taught, as Buddha taught, the animation here, it's the next level of prayer. 
which is, you know, you got to help me manage me. It's not about you praying anymore for, would you mind changing my life? That, that's, no. No. You have to understand, would you help me manage the power in me? Help me. You've, I'm a power system of such, you've, wow. Help me. Help me not harm another human being with a thought. Help me here. Help me. You've made me so much. Help me. I got to surrender this to you. That's surrender. You tell me what to do here. I am an instrument. I am your hands in the world. Now I get it. Be my hands in the world. Be my heart in the world. Now I get it. Buddha, that's illusion. What does Buddha say? Have the strength to hold yourself back so you don't attach yourself to a spectacle. Let the spectacle go by. Let the spectacle go by. What's a spectacle? Could be anything. I go up to Annette and say, well, I don't like the scarf. I don't like the scarf. Nyeh, 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 nyeh. <laughs> In one second, I'll be going. I'm nothing but a spectacle. To attach is to anchor. For the small ego, then you have to go process. What are you talking about? Are you so fragile? Are you so fragile that that would gut you? And you want to come to me later and say you've got to heal cancer when you can't handle a scarf? That's how fragile you are? No, 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 no. This is about you realizing I am so powerful. I have to train myself. I will not respond to that. I w I'm not going to take anything personally. This is how I pray. All right, God, hold on. I need grace now. I'm losing it. I'm taking something personally. So help me to see clearly. Help me to see this clearly. Now it's about me driving my soul. That's how we pray. And I realize all the more how much I breathe with everybody in their soul how much I breathe with everyone, how much I breathe with all life. I live in a mystic soul now. I dwell there. I dwell, I breathe with the birds, with the trees. It's all one to me now. That's how my prayer works. There's no separation anymore. Does that make sense to you? The universe, that's why for me God is everywhere. It's never been a more intimate universe. It, totally organized, totally impersonal in terms of its systems. There's no such thing as God liking that. That's nonsense to me. And therefore it's fully intimate. There is nothing that's missed. That's how come if a, if a leaf falls from a tree, it's known. That totally makes sense to me. I don't get it, but it makes sense. Yeah? Question. Yeah, I can see you're full of questions. Face full of questions, dang. Unmistakable. <laughs> go. Yeah, go. Anyway, yeah. Just grab it and go. Okay. Uh, you asked earlier that most of us started on this journey because we must have asked ourselves, what is my purpose in life? Why am I here today? Yeah. And honestly, <coughs> I don't know if I did ask myself mm -hmm. that question. And you just mentioned a word that I love just now, surrender. Mm. And I'm sitting here thinking, why do I need to know what my purpose is? Yeah. Why do I need to know why I'm here in this life? If I just surrendering to God, And God is going to show me the way. And God will be guiding me. No, no. So, I'm just going to surrender. Mm -hmm. And whatever is going to happen will happen. So, I don't need to know. Yeah. I guess it is what I'm saying. <coughs> and it's not just you don't need to know. 
it's all it's more than that it's that every day you have to it's oftentimes when and I'm not sure you mean it this way but oftentimes when people say that to me they mean it in the physical I don't need to know but still I look and still I look for signs in the physical well I'm answering things for other and so I still look for things to work in a certain way in the physical or to unfold in a certain way in the physical and <clears throat> So they still look for the manifestations of God in the physical and then therefore in ways that suit, here's part two of that, polarity thinking, which means it has to be easy. If it's not easy, if it's, if it's difficult, then God's not there. So it has to be easy. It has to be pain-free because if there's pain, then God's not there. It has to be right, right, otherwise it's wrong and God's not there. So you slip in, always when you're in the physical world, you think in terms of polarity, which means you also think in terms of time. So it means you think in terms of the immediate in the moment. So you look at everything in the moment as if you can see anything at all from the first floor. You're looking from the first floor. You're looking at all this stuff right now, and if it's a mess, and if it's here, and if it's and, and in the immediate, and you, if it doesn't make sense to you right then, right then, and if it's difficult, then something must be wrong. Because that's how you calculate when you look in through the lens of time, space, stuff, polarity. And that's what a lot of people do. And some part of you does, or it wouldn't be weighing on you, okay? Whereas if, if you know, and I get that, I get that. It's very, because we, we are in the physical world, so let's face it. I mean, <clears throat> if you're hungry, you're looking for food. So there it is, it's as simple as that. Um, the other, but from the, what is also true, the truth, the truth, is that uh, prayer is a 360 degree energetic, nonstop energy, uh, energetic grace response that's happening in every single movement of everything the moment you say a prayer. Now you don't understand that. We can't understand that, we can't comprehend that because it's not the way we work. But from the second we utter a prayer, all things, if you, if you release the prayer and say, get busy, help me out. Somehow that electricity of grace is active in the air and functioning. How it may work in someone's thought forms, how it may organize cause and effect, and how that cause and effect may be operating on something that you won't see for a month, but it's the system's engaged. The system is engaged. And if you immediately look to the physical, and here's where you get yourself in trouble. You look, and people always do this, they say a prayer and they look to their history. It has to solve that problem and it has to answer that and it has to be this and that. And they look to their history to make a certain thing better or to make something better. And they look at the way things have been resolved historically. And they can't imagine something being resolved other than the way they've been resolved historically or if it's never been resolved, well then it can't possibly be resolved because look what happened before. So you tend to look backwards to your history instead of realizing that has nothing to do with how prayers are answered. You're being an ordinary mortal. So when you do say a prayer, add and help me not be an ordinary mortal. Help me not think like an ordinary mortal. Get me out of myself. Okay, just show off, just show off. 
and then lights out, go to bed. Yeah. That, that jacket you're wearing wouldn't be in cashmere, would it? No. Oh, then I really would take that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in, yeah. In speaking to personal purpose, yeah. I have been very deeply working on your instruction for the last nine months deep. Yeah. Where I spend an hour with your talks every day. I have a spiritual director now. I do my practice. Everything you have said, I did the retreat with you, I have taken in as deeply as I can, and then I pray to take it deeper. And what I've learned my purpose is, is to wake up and live my life. Bingo. That my children are my teachers, that my partner is my teacher, that where I go to the market when I have a meeting at my son's school, that is my purpose, how I treat my customers, my employees, that is my purpose. And I don't have to make it any further than that. Bingo. That's it. I am fully in the life you gave me. And then think maybe of something that. else will come. <laughs> no, think of that sentence. I am fully in the life you gave me. Thank you. And when I, I, I don't often leave where I live. And when I drove away to come here, I was so deeply moved by my life Bingo. and my family. And normally I just do, no matter how hard I work, I take them all for granted. And my daughter drives me crazy, and my son drives me crazy. And I had to drink wine every night because my life drove me crazy, drove me crazy, and I stopped. And I'm just, I guess I'll stop speaking too, but my point is, as soon as I really showed up for my life, everything... It didn't drive you crazy. One of the greatest gifts you can give yourself. One of the greatest gifts, and I know that because this happened to me four years ago. So let me say it took a, lot, a bit of time, and I hope it doesn't take you as much time, but is to step fully into the life you've been given. I have to tell you, nothing feels as good. I, 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 and mine came after uh, I broke off yet another engagement. But no, no, I'll tell you this and we're going for a break. Not kidding, not kidding. It's the truth. That, right, is it not the truth, guys? Is it not the truth? Right. And after, after I broke it off the first hour, I exploded in ecstasy and I thought, this isn't right. <laughs> this isn't right. And then I got happier the next hour. And then the next hour. And then my mother said, something's wrong. And I said, no. So then I woke up the next morning. And I was still in my happy bubble. And I thought, this is not right. This isn't right. And then I got up the next morning. I was in the happy, the happy bubble was bigger. And I thought, this isn't right. And then it got bigger and bigger. And I kept thinking, I'm not moving. Because this is like so, and I even thought that one day I got to walk slowly because I'm going to break this happy bubble. <laughs> and it got bigger and bigger. And I thought, what the heck? I mean, I, I'm not prone to hallucinations, but if I was, this wasn't bad. And I thought, what the heck is going on here, right? And then I realized I was fully me. Fully, totally me. I was, a, I was, and I am a mystic, and I am a writer, and I am fully this, and I don't want to marry, and I don't want anybody in my life, and I love the life I live, and I am just fully, totally happy me. And yes, I, 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 I just, yeah, I mean, I thought, wow. I felt so whole, so complete, so fully full. I can't even, I, I was like in ex, and I've never wanted, I've never ever in my, like for the first time I thought, I don't want to be anybody, I don't want to be anywhere else, I don't want to do anything else. I, every night I think, thank you for the create, creative mind you've given me, the creative soul you've given me, for the, the business partner, my family, every, thank you, thank you, thank you, good night. With only thanks. 
that, that, that's it. I, you don't want to be anywhere else. You never tell yourself, I know there's something. <laughs> no, there's not. This is your something. <laughs> And there's plenty of work in that. And there's plenty, and there's <laughs> celebration. It's just, it's never diminish what you've been given. You've been given so much. But and then and they gave us a break out there too, by the way. So I'm getting the <laughs> signal. So okay, let's take a let's take a 20 25 minute break.